right, everybody, let's do this thing. I'm Drew McManus, the author of Adaptistration, and this is my podcast, Shop Talk, where I invite captivating guests to talk about engaging topics connected to the orchestra business. And the two captivating guests I have here today start off with uh, Jeff Von Saul. Jeff is the executive director of the Spokane Symphony and Martin Woolton Theater at the Fox, a position he has held since 2016. He's credited with infusing the organization with renewed verve and has increased revenues from 4 million to over 6 million, an increase of over 50% in three years for those of you who were not doing the math already. He has also spearheaded efforts to broaden the reach of the symphony at the Vox, expanding the range of concerts and events and establishing a program for children to attend symphony performances free of charge. Hi, Jeff. Hello, Drew. Good, good to be to here. Good to see you. Hey, it's good to see you too. And Jeff was actually the first person I reached out to to see about getting today's program up and running. And I said, Jeff, who do I need to invite? And he said, I am absolutely not coming on this show unless you get Zach Bassard to be on this show. And so that's, that's the second person we were able to convince uh, be on the, the program tonight. And Zach is the president and CEO of the Toledo Alliance for the Performing Arts, which consists of the symphony, the Toledo Ballet, actually just those two, the Toledo Symphony and the Toledo Ballet. Prior to his work in the arts, he was a marketing consultant, primarily working with Fortune 100 firms. Hello, Zach. Hey, Drew. Thank you so much for including me in this discussion tonight. It's great to see you and to see Jeff. And thank you guys both for being here. Well, what we're going to talk about today is what uh, orchestra administrators need, which is a fairly broad topic, but we're definitely going to narrow it down and get in, into some meta. I think for the folks at home, you know, if they know already where Toledo is and where Spokane is, are you guys, though, comparatively roughly equal budgets or different? Uh, I think we're we're pretty close, Zach. I think you're um, a little bit larger now since your uh, your merger um, and and conjoining with uh, with the ballet. Um, right. I'd say that the little bit of the difference is that we uh, are are the symphony and our um, uh, affiliation is with our concert hall. So we own and operate the concert hall, which allows us to do uh, a really interesting uh, breadth of activities. Uh, which we're going to get into talking about in a little while. So if our, our business model might be a little bit different than some other orchestras. Uh, but I think the answer is that Zach's, Zach's is a little bit larger than Spokane. Uh, and, and, and I think this is one of the great characteristics of the orchestra world is that we'll all sit down and say we're roughly the same orchestras and we'll sit down at the same table, but then we'll spend a lot of time trying to identify what makes us all unique. Some of us own our own halls. Some of us don't. Some of us rent. Some of us um, merge with the ballet, which, as we have done uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, and uh, we all live in different markets. So I, based on my conversations with Jeff, I love talking to Jeff because we have very similar orchestra experiences. I don't have a hall. He has a hall. I have a ballet. He doesn't have a ballet. Um, but um, from the orchestra to orchestra perspective, we're very apples to apples. One of the remarkable things about this industry, Drew, is that it, what, what can work really well for Jeff in Spokane, we can rob blind into, in, into the Toledo market and make money off of, and it doesn't hurt Jeff and it helps us. So um, from my perspective as an old industry consultant, I don't know that the for-profit model has any way to track with this sort of multi-orchestra perspective that we have in our own programming um, here in the, in, the, in the orchestra world. Because uh, Jeff and I can, uh, can plan the exact same pop series and have very different results. And then we can go back and figure out why. And I love that about this industry. Well, and now that is a perfect item to kind of like bite into first, which is the finding out why, because my experience in the field has been over the years, it's gotten better, but it's still a very insular sort of information highway between organizations. Uh, and there are people who tend to get locked into working into certain career paths at certain budget sizes. Mm -hmm. And the gulf between them ends up being large enough that people on one side of that budget fence try to emulate what someone on the other side does, and it never really works well. 
And one of my favorite little anecdotes is uh, there was a big eight manager who shall not be named that did an amazing job building that orchestra to where it ended up becoming by the time he retired and decided that as a retirement job, he was going to start working with a smaller budget, you know, vanity orchestra, very high quality, you know, but far fewer events, much smaller budget and much smaller staff. And all of a sudden he determined like less than a year <laughs> into the job that, yeah, you know, this is actually an awful lot of work when you don't have a personal assistant and departments full of several people with lots of years of experience and others who are asking you how to do the things that you're asking them to accomplish. Yeah, it's an entirely different ballpark at that point. And, you know, I've known Jeff longer than, than, than Zach and Jeff and I have had these conversations before. Jeff, you know, I'm going to let you kind of like take it from there. Hmm. Well, it's a <laughs> it's a broad subject. Perhaps this could be a recurring uh, <laughs> gathering that we have over the next few months. Um, yeah, I mean, look, these are the challenges that we all face. Um, how to be a bunch of things to a bunch of different people. Uh, and that those just even starting there, that what are those things and who are those people? The answers might differ from person to person. What does that say? I, I'm going to go back, boy, almost, it's funny, almost 20 years now. In my first go at being involved in an orchestra, not, not being the trumpet player on stage, was um, a very uh, young um, age, uh, right after college, helping a little youth orchestra outside of Boston. And I remember um, I, I was wanting to get involved and I, the league had helped. Um, and I had gone to this um, career services seminar at, at NEC where I went to college and somebody there said, you know, just volunteer, just get your foot in the door, just volunteer, get started doing something. And I thought, oh, that's okay. Yeah, let's do it. So I called around and I, I got myself invited to some board meeting at this little youth orchestra that's still going outside of Boston in Framingham. Um, and I, I remember asking these questions, like, I think it would be valuable to look at who are the stakeholders in and around the organization and what are their priorities and what's the same and what's different about those priorities and where does that put us right now and in the future? And I think, Man, I, that was, that's something I've come back to from time to time is just looking at the constellation of stakeholders and values. Then we get into the tactics. Then we get into resource acquisition. Like we said, it's, it's complicated. Our job is to represent the best of the community, the best of human spirit, uh, deploy things that are unique uh, in what we do in, in presenting concerts, usually orchestral, sometimes in my case, it's not orchestral, um, and do it in a way that's, that's a repeatable success. Um, but the way that we, we come about that is um, it's delicate and, it's, and it, it's fragile and it's easy to, to not quite get it right. If we look at this industry, as I said, like we have a lot of similar organizations operating in simil similar budget categories and similar MSAs, for lack of a better term, um, we all solve the problem differently. And I don't know that any of us is right. But the one thing that I really um, come back to is that if at the end of the day, we are tasked with competing objectives, we have to be really creative. And those competing objectives are one that's really siloed in tradition and repertoire and performance practice and how we dress and what we and how many rehearsals we have and how large our core is and then we go on this side and we figure out how to pay the bills that seems to be an admission that one way of doing this is not adequate to achieve the other Objective. So we need to have this other angel or other spirit on our shoulder whispering in our ear in order to make the, the balance sheet work, right? So I, I come into this saying that at the end of the day, I'm an old marketing consultant. This is the greatest marketing challenge that I can think of. If I were to write a white paper and take it to HBR and try to figure out 
what are we going to say different about the business world today? I would say, find me your 10 best students at Harvard Business School and figure out how to make classical music relevant to a Midwest mid-size uh, population. And there are many orchestras who take this challenge every day and do it really well. And there are many orchestras who live one state, north, south, east, or west from those orchestras and don't do it as well. So there are all sorts of individual fluctuations that make this to be a really challenging um, uh, problem to solve. But what I love about it is that at the end of the day, relevance has to be really focal to us, but also innovation has to be really focal to us. And, and, and Jeff and I talk about this a lot. Um, the arts are known for what? I mean, we're known for being creative. We employ dozens and dozens of creative minds. Uh, going into this pandemic, by the way, Drew, I mean, we looked around and we said, if we can't figure this out with 140 people on staff in our organization, all of whom are creative by nature, well, nobody can. So we can find ways to innovate through this challenge, but many other challenges. And in the arts, I feel like we struggle a lot to find ways to be innovative. And there are obvious challenges. If we have uh, a slew of, of funders who want to be traditional, they don't want to find a new way of doing things. So we're, beholding, we're, 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 we're beholden to them. But also, if we find uh, a new way of, of, of building the mousetrap, there are many who would say that that is not in our prerogative. And some of those people sit on our boards, and some of those people are our donors, and some of those people are both. So as long as we're shackled to this idea of being chained, basically doing the things that we did in 1890, the industry cannot evolve. And this is why I say I'm fascinated by this industry from a big business perspective, in that there are many orchestras doing the same things. We're also, also putting ourselves um, encumbered by the same shackles. And as soon as we can unshackle ourselves and embrace innovation, as the league has talked about a lot, we really start to find new ways forward. And that ultimately makes bigger audiences, greater cause for relevance, and a more simple way to simply engage in the art form that we all agree at the start line, we want to propel. There are I, I, so many rabbit holes that I, 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 I want to go in reverse and back up and go down and take, take about two hours to hit each one of those. But right. Jeff, go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm going to make a bold statement based on what, what Zach's just saying, and I agree with him 100%. Here's the bold statement. Orchestras are not innovative. They just are not innovative. We are creative. And yes, the work that we do is very beautiful. And I love orchestras. I've dedicated my entire life. I started playing trumpet when I was four. And I mean, my, my most favorite um, thing that, that I encounter in this world is walking through the stage door because it's something I have done since before kindergarten. Um, and I love it, but it doesn't change. And, and that is a challenge. Um, I think there is a, a, a sense of awe and mystique that we get, and I get it, from sitting in the hall on a Saturday night and hearing the orchestra play beautifully. And it is, it is wonderful. But I think they can also then get us a little caught or stuck in a, in a sort of a false equivalency. Um, and then we sort of keep going and doing it the same way. And it's time to think about some new, fundamentally different ways to, to approach some things. Well, and on that point, I wanna, oh, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, I, 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 um, when I was a consultant um, in marketing, I often work with arts organizations and my favorite slide is still my favorite slide to start every presentation with. And it's a picture of the BSO from 1890. And they're not even or in, in orchestra hall. Um, they're all wearing penguin outfits. They're all men, they're all white, they all have beards. They're sitting in the same configuration that we sit now, except there are bases on the back wall. They don't do that anymore in orchestra hall. <laughs> um, but it's like, it, that's the best that we can do is epitomize something that was considered great in 1890. Yeah. Find me another industry, automotive, 
electronic, agricultural, that would say our best time was 1890, right? So mm-hmm. herein lies the challenge between the repertoire and the relevance and, and, and serving the community when we're still wearing Victorian outfits and running a Victorian organization. Right. And boy, th- there, were, there were two things that I want to hit from your first statement, Zach, that I think really kind of frame this. One is relevance, which is one of my favorite words to hate. <laughs> also my, my least favorite word. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because it always comes down to, okay, great. Define that. Yeah. How do you want to talk about that? And people toss it around as though everyone understands what they're talking about. And that just isn't right. And so we all get a, off base and we end up with very incomplete conversations. Um, the next one though is the, the distinct but often missed difference between creativity and innovation, which are two really very different things. Um, and when it comes to innovation, I think we're certainly living at a time right now in the middle of this pandemic where we are paying the price literally and figuratively for a lack of innovation over the years. It's not even necessarily a complete lack of will, but a lot of the decision makers, which come from the board and the donor class, aren't real thrilled with this because you have to accept a minimum level of risk and loss and failure to be able to innovate. And this is not a field that rewards risk, loss, and failure. It's the exact opposite. You will get punished and punished badly for it. Mm -hmm. I can't even count the number of administrators in the last two years I know have been great administrators who have lost jobs because they just didn't want to toe the line quite as closely as a board wanted them to toe. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that, you know, again, it comes back to where we are and the problems that we're seeing right now. Well, and, and this is a time that challenges us all to, to step up because let's face it, there are a lot of reasons that a lot of orchestras are closing their doors. And that is not a way of saying that they're choosing not to serve their community. A lot of these organizations operate at very small margins, many in a deficit position, And going into this world where we have smaller socially distanced audiences and socially distanced orchestras and safety parameters, it's a really good reason to say, not for me. If you're a per-service orchestra, that challenge is exacerbated tenfold, right? If we are looking at this as a way to refocus and step back and find the way forward, it's also a really great way to get our musicians and our staff and our boards to step up in a way that they've never been able to before. Recessions are really good for this because we can always say, how are we gonna be different on the other side of this than we were before? But this is a pandemic and we have the unusual perspective that everybody is sitting at home and we're all reading, we're binge watching, but we aren't embracing an active performing arts focus. So once that's available to us again, how do we optimize it? How is it different than before? Now is really one of those challenges to say, let's take advantage of this situation and do it better than we did before, do it differently than we did before, and take a lot of risks that we would not have taken in a good economy. And one of my favorite um, experiences from the last five months was a trustee who who leaned on me outside of a board meeting and said, you know, you're trying to do something that in a good economy, I would have voted down every day of the week. But now is the time to experiment and to be nimble and to learn what you don't know and learn how to do it better. Because by the time the economy and the world comes back online, you're going to be at least one hairs run faster on the track than the slowest tor- the tortoise. And, and this is really the point where we can innovate and be celebrating that in the arts. And, and I can't agree with him more. I, would, I just want to add on to that. I agree with you. And I think it, if our tactics are going to look a little bit different, um, we also need to be willing to look at a couple other sort of facets of organizational existence. Uh, I I can think of a few. Um, The culture uh, 
of the organization, the strategy, um, how we spend our time, uh, what kind of people we have, sort of the external perspective, right? There's a whole model we could talk about here. Um, and if you want to change one thing, if you want to change the tactics, you have to be willing to look at a couple of those. Other, otherwise, yeah, you'll change them for about a week. Um, but if you can change the culture and you can adopt an, a culture of experimentation, um, that will work. It, that so, does work. I would love to interrupt you for a second because one of the things that you've, in, you've embraced that I've always been jealous of at your orchestra is this concept of risk capital. And it's part of your budget and it's something that your, your board is completely online with and embracing of. Can you talk that, a little bit about how that's unique? That may be slightly past tense right now. <laughs> mm. All right. Something you used to say. Has me, been. Has ago. been. Pause. Pause. It, it, is, it is paused. <laughs> Great. Well, look, this is a wonderful real-time example of mm. how does an organization and the individuals that make it up prioritize um, risk-taking, uh, are we more in the, in the modality of harnessing mm. or unleashing across a, a, a bunch of different elements of the organization? Economics, creativity, personnel, right? Again, mm -hmm. another little model we could build up and, and develop and deploy. So what Zach's talking about is that here in Spokane, um, and, and I, I need to say Spokane is a pretty remarkable uh, city and it's really supportive. The people who live here really want an orchestra. And that in itself, boy, it makes a difference. Um, this, this backdrop that I have here is, is the picture of the hall. And the hall is beautiful. And it's because people gave a fair amount of money um, about 12 years ago now to, to renovate it. Um, so, so there is a, a sort of an intrinsic willingness to invest in things that are wants. Um, now, since my time here, we, we've, we've done a bunch of interesting things. We've advanced the, um, the identity and the, the sort of value uh, proposition um, of the hall itself and expanding on uh, the work that is beyond just the symphony work. Um, we have a bunch of sort of subsidiary business units that, that function within the hall. We have a wedding business. We do events. We own our own bar. We, have, we do our own ticketing system now. You know, each of those could have gone the other way. And there have been some things that have not worked out as well as we would have hoped. So overall, yes, I mean, Zach, you're right. <laughs> this, is, this has been an interesting place because we've been able to try out some things. Uh, and and it, some of them have worked, which has sort of stoked the fire to keep going and try some more. I mean, I think if you if you strike out five out of five times, maybe that the, the tendency is to not keep trying that. Um, uh, there's a wonderful book written by a mentor of mine called Experimentation Works, written by this guy named Stefan Tomke. And uh, it's really wonderful way to begin to explore within yourself of how could you in your organization create this culture and create a way of thinking around experimentation that then translates into tactics. Um, so that's one idea. Then the other one is really engaging in a meaningful um, and, and authentic way those around you. And that notion is this, this notion of collective genius um, written by another, uh, another person who I know who's just an incredible uh, mentor, um, Linda Hill. And, and so the notion there is to create the environment conducive to organizational success. And that means everybody in the organization is going to um, participate and and uh, be additive in their slice of collective genius, um, and and that's not easy. That is not that is not the default way to do things. Um, so it takes some work and it takes some willingness on behalf of of those in both in power and those who are uh, in the organization at all levels to believe in in each other. Um, but if you can actually create that environment create that culture, um, the economic output will at some point be reflective uh, of that. And I think it'll be positive. We're doing a really good job, I think, of flying around at that 30,000 foot 
area, <laughs> uh, talking about ideas and approaches and whatnot. And we need to, to like take a nosedive and, and get much, much closer to the ground. Um, there were a couple of things about taking, I think everything you were just talking about, Jeff, about changing the internal culture to be, you know, to, to be less risk averse. Um, and for those folks also watching this, if you don't know, 70% earned income in this field is really high. Most people have a, you know, a much closer balance um, with what their contributed revenue is and then kind of bridged between those two with uh, their investment and in grant uh, income. But one of the ways to actually, I think, start to approach making effective change in all of this, and I don't know if either of you have read the book, Yes And by Kelly Leonard. Yeah, yeah, really good book about actually how to go about doing this. It's almost an instructional manual, really. Um, and it really is about changing narrative and changing culture. And it's, it's flexible enough to be applied to just about any situation. But one in particular, even though I know you've got the really high earned income now, Jim, yeah. is, <laughs> is focusing on one of the weaknesses in orchestras, which is not diversifying their end income streams. Now, in Jeff's situation, this is where one of the big differences between groups that own and or manage their venue and those who don't, it's a huge difference to what you're capable of doing. But even though you're in one bucket or the other, being able to actually start to look at diversifying your income. So the main thing that you do is not entirely tied to <laughs> a bunch of people, buy tickets, they sit in the concert, you play at them and they leave. Yeah. And that I, brings yeah. in all kinds of other great stuff. Can I, can I just reflect on that for 20 sure. seconds? So something that I want to continue thinking about, and I, I just don't know if it's going to work or not because of a world that we are in right now, is um, really diversifying our business model, right? So our hall that we own occupies about two thirds of a block. What about that other third? What are we doing with it? Uh, is, it's a parking lot. Is that the best use? <clears throat> Well, to me, that's really fascinating. I mean, I'd love to build, you know, um, an empire, right? And, and, and have the orchestra be funded then in part through some of those proceeds. Now, some people say, Jeff, you're brilliant. Go do it. Other people say, Jeff, how many coffees have you had today, man? Slow it down. What are you, what are you thinking? Are the people who say the first one also named Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> but so it, it triggers, again, a set of interesting thoughts. Oh, if absolutely. you could do it right, well, shoot, of course you do it. That sounds great. Yeah. The question is, what if it doesn't go right? Now you're into some project for 80 million bucks and not quite sure how to make the next mortgage payment. And you sink the organization in the process because I've seen so, groups that have done that. Yeah. Anyway, that, that notion, that specific concept really fascinates me. So I would yes. take a slightly different approach to that. I, I would not take on the capital costs because that's what terrifies many organizations of this mid-sized budget tier. And if you look around at those who are working within their own halls right now, um, you start to realize that a lot of the, the hall owners, whether it's orchestra or um, performing arts organizations, they, they make a, a, a bulk of their money from touring programs. And that money goes to subsidize the orchestra work, which is considered to be the lost leader, right? Um, so one of the big problems that we're facing right now is that a lot of those touring Broadway shows or touring talent groups are staying home. And again, there are a lot of good reasons for that. But if that has been the licorice that we've been attracted to, to cover our bills so that we can continue this art form, I think we're also ignoring the fact that this, this environment that we're in provides us with an unprecedented ability to get out and be virtual for those who want to be consuming a virtual product. And live streaming, of course, is, is going crazy in our industry right now. Um, in Toledo, we, we've, we've been investing in video um, dynamics in different ways for about five years now. And the truth is, is that even if you're just showing people in the hall who are watching a piano concerto um, videography in real time of what's happening on stage and what's happening on a piano keyboard, they're going to engage in more meaningful ways. So in that way, innovation can make people in this space engage 
and pay it more attention and tune out less and, and be more likely to return for another performance. So that's all good. But what if you can take that same video and make more money off of it? So you perform it once, you get the ticket revenue, you get people in the hall to be more engaged, but you also find more ways to, to monetize that out on the, the internet or on a cable television pay-per-view model. Um, these are ways that every organization that, that performs live music in front of a camera can do that. Now, until now, most of that content has gone on to YouTube. And I feel like that's a really big challenge because it's a lot like the newspapers who started giving all their content away for free and relying on ad revenue. No, we're not going to be able to do that. We're not going to be able to do that in the in the YouTube world where we're all trying to do the same thing. The ad revenue will never make up the new audience that we're trying to get. So we have to be smarter than the newspapers and take a lesson from them from 25 years ago and find a way to monetize it. And there are a lot of ways to do that. There are also a lot of bad ways to do that. So I feel like that as we look forward five years, we'll have figured that out. We're all gonna try to do something a little bit different it might be chamber music, it might be full orchestra music, it might be archival video. Um, but the ability to serve our communities and really go to where everybody is, to remove the obstacles, to pull down the challenges of coming into a concert hall, the expectations of, do I know the right vocabulary? Do I know what an adagio is, what an allegro is? Do I know what a concerto is versus a symphony? Do I know what a violin is versus an oboe? All of that stuff goes away when you're in the privacy of your own home. I often say it's the same thing as going to a gym and being afraid of trying new equipment because you don't know how you're supposed to do it <laughs> and therefore being more comfortable gaining weight, right? Going into an orchestra hall is often the same kind of challenge is that you don't know what you're supposed to say, enjoy, feel here. So you'd rather stay at home and never get there. So we're in an unusual opportunity right now to, um, to exacerbate the challenge, but also solve it in, at the same time. And if we don't all focus on the multimedia perspective, then we're really going to look back and wish what we had. Because this is the way to get people who never came, people who came but stopped coming, people who are lazy, who say, Look, I love what you're doing, but the last thing I want to do on a Friday night is get dressed up in a suit and come downtown and have to have dinner and then find a parking spot and then go sit through a concert that's going to put me to bed. I'd much rather drink my own wine and watch it from home. Mm -hmm. We're in that position right now, and we can do that. And we can do it now because we have to, because there's a pandemic. But if we don't figure out how to do it now, then we'll never know how to do it in the future. And I'm gonna take exactly that moment to to capitalize on leave them wanting a little more. <laughs> because I, we are at the point where we need to kind of wrap things up, but oh yeah, we're gonna come back and have another conversation just about that concept in particular. On that note, we are gonna just wrap things up now. Thanks everyone for taking your time out to watch our little program here. And I especially wanna extend my thanks to both Zach and Jeff for taking your time out on a week night, evening, from family, friends, and all the other stuff that has to go on, including your own time and relaxing and recharging. So thank you very much for, ta for taking your time to share with everybody here. Thank you, Drew. And thanks, thank Zach. you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.